Hi, I think we're ready for ready to start. Uh, thanks for joining us this evening. Welcome to this Dowdy Street seminar uh, on the recent High Court judgment on Zambrano Carers and the EU Settlement Scheme. My name is Bea Rivers of Hackney Community Law Centre. I'm joined by Simon Cox and Mike Spencer, both barristers at Dowdy Street. So as usual, you will notice that your mics are muted and your videos are off. This is a pre-setting, so please don't be alarmed. It just stops any background interference. Uh, we're looking forward to your questions and comments, of course. So if you do have any questions for the panel, please use the Q&A function on your screen to make sure that we see them. If you have comments that you want to share with everyone on the webinar, please use the chat function. Um, I'll share your questions with the panel for them to answer, um, of which I'm also a member during the webinar, and I may post them to the chat too. So if you don't have time for your questions, we'll try and respond by email. Um, we're recording the webinar and a copy will be available on our website soon after we finish uh, for you or any colleagues who are unable to attend today. So we really hope the cinema, uh, seminar sorry, will be useful for you and for us uh, as we actually have another hearing tomorrow to cover further relief and I will let Simon go over that with you later. I hope that most of you will have heard about the judgment uh, maybe read it, possibly already know a lot about it. For those of you who don't, I will provide a brief summary on the facts of the case, and then I will talk a little bit about some of the issues faced by clients, individuals, families, like the claimant in this case, who have been unlawfully excluded from applying under the EU settlement scheme. Um, I'll then hand over to Mike, who will provide a summary of the judgment. Uh, he'll talk a little bit about relief and the impact of the deadline and goes over some of the legal provisions relevant uh, to whether or not people should make parallel applications. So I know that's a question a lot of people um, have in the sector. And then Simon will deal in more detail with impact for individual classes of claimants and talk about our hearing tomorrow and the implications of that. Um, and then hopefully we'll have an opportunity to go through some of the questions. Okay, so we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to I'm going to get going um, with a little bit of a summary and a little bit of background on the case. So, you know, what was this case about? In the judgment handed down on the 9th of June, 2021, uh, the High Court found that Zambrano carers do not lose their EU law right to reside just because they have permission to remain granted under a route other than Appendix EU of the immigration rules. So up to now, the Home Office had been refusing to grant Appendix EU status to Zambrano carers uh, who had some kind of permission to remain, some other kind of permission to remain, typically, as in the case of our claimant, as a parent under Appendix FM. So a Zambrano carer, for anyone who doesn't know, um, is a non-EEA national primary carer of a British citizen who's residing in the UK. Um, and who has a right to reside. Um, if their removal from the UK would require the British citizen child to leave the UK and the EU. So this judgment, you know, obviously now gives hope to potentially thousands of non-EU national parents of British citizens who are trying to regularise their status in the UK in this period now that we're in, which is the run up to the 30th of June deadline for applications on the EUSS, which is, I think, in a couple of weeks now. So I'll give you a little uh, background on the case. The claimant in this case is a single mother of four children, the eldest of whom is British. So uh, she was granted a derivative right to reside as a Zambrano carer in 2012. Her British child was born in 2011. She, in 2018, while working, she collapsed at work while nine months pregnant with her third child. Um, due to high blood pressure and was advised by her doctor that she was at risk of a stroke if she returned to work. So she fell into rent arrears, uh, she was evicted, she ended up um, under Section 17 support. She made a change of conditions application, um, which was refused because she was not entitled to recourse as a Zambrano carer. 
And she was advised by the Home Office in that refusal letter that if she wanted to access recourse to public funds, she would need to make an application under Appendix FM as the parent of a British child for limited to leave, limited leave to remain, sorry, on the 10 year route, um, which she did in April, 2019. That application was granted in July, 2019, um, during which time the Home Office guidance um, and rules changed to allow access to the settlement scheme to Zambrano carers. So we subsequently made an application under Appendix EU with exceptional case funding, which was refused on the basis that she'd already had limited leave to remain and was therefore excluded under paragraph B of the definition of Zambrano carers in Appendix EU. Um, her application was made in January, 2020. Um, and so it didn't have a right of appeal. So this left our clients stuck at the start of a 10 year route to settlement rather than being granted indefinite leave to remain. Um, this route, the 10 year route, as I'm sure many of you are more than aware, poses a number of serious issues and problems and challenges to many of those who are on it. Uh, we co collected, sorry, a lot of evidence from various organizations for this case. Um, just quickly, including Praxis, Project 17, Hackney Migrant Centre, Rights of Women, Ramfell, the Unity Project, Coram, Southwark Law Centre, I hope I'm not forgetting anyone, but who were all really wonderful in putting together statements for us within very, very short time scales uh, regarding the practical consequences and implications to people on the ground of this exclusion of this group of predominantly single mothers from being able to apply for settled status. Uh, the majority of clients on this 10 year route category are single mothers, around 76% actually, according to data from Hackney Migrant Centre. This limited form of leave is precarious and the applications are you know, expensive, extremely expensive and complex. They amount to thousands of pounds every two and a half years. At the end of the 10 year route, when they should be able to apply for settlement, providing they haven't had any breaks in their leave during that 10 year period. The application fee for ILR is, well, at the moment it's 2,389 pounds and there's no option of a fee waiver. So that poses another challenge um, to securing indefinite leave. And from the research and data provided us by these organizations, and obviously from our own experience working in the law center, clients who are parents of British children on the 10 year settlement are really often destitute living in poverty, um, either because they're subject to a, a no recourse to public funds condition or because their wages and benefits are really insufficient to cover the high cost of living, you know, especially in London. Um, so common issues reported by families on this route include eviction, rent arrears, debt, inadequate and overcrowded housing, um, dependency on abusive and or exploitative relationships um, and essential living needs going unmet. So this includes parents and children skipping meals. Um, and like I said before, an application out of time, even by a month, can mean that an applicant is placed back at the start of the, the 10 years. So many clients with recourse to public funds don't realise also that they need to make specific rep representations with every application um, for that recourse to continue. Um, so what can happen is they, they don't make those rep representations, they're granted leave without recourse, and then whether they know about the change of conditions application or not, um, even if they do, that takes time to gather evidence and process, and the family can easily fall into destitution. Um, in published research by the Unity Project, 6% of single women surveyed with the NRPF stipulation on their leave had been street homeless with their children. Um, and single mother clients have reported across the sector having to engage in survival sex in order to access accommodation and meet their family's essential uh, subsistence needs. So. Organisations we spoke to really noted that families experience this range of issues concurrently, usually. And of course, these circumstances, even in the short term, have a really serious and long term impact on the welfare and development of children. Um, so these are just some of the really significant disadvantages for the cohort affected by this judgment, um, who up to this point have been unlawfully excluded under Appendix EU. And this is a cohort that could amount to potentially thousands of people. From what we're hearing from support organisations, from my own experience at the Law Centre, um, I think Coram alone, through their project with Hackney Migrant Centre and Harrogate Migrant Centre, advised 238 families 
and individuals in the last two years alone um, who are primary carers of British children and would potentially now be eligible to make an EUSS application. So that's a little bit of background um, and some information just on the human impact of the immigration rules and guidance as they have been implemented up till now. Um, I'll hand over now to Mike, who will take us through a summary of the judgment. Mike, over to you. Thank you, Bea. Um, can, can you hear me? Just checking. Sorry, the screen has yes. changed. Great. Um, so Bea has outlined and described some of the very compelling factual reasons why this case is so important um, to many lone parents of uh, British citizen children in the UK. Um, I'm going to delve into some of the law. Um, the issue of law in the judgment was quite a simple one. And that was whether a, a right to reside, a derivative right to reside on uh, Ruiz Zambrano grounds is extinguished by a grant of limited leave to remain uh, by the state on some other grounds, such as uh, under Article 8 of the UCHR. And the court answered that question in the negative, no, it isn't ex extinguished. Um, so that's pretty much the simple issue. Uh, but the reason why that's important, uh, how we got there, um, and uh, why the answer is no, uh, is quite a convoluted story. So it's necessary to go back and have a look at that story. Uh, it's not a story that covers the Secretary of State in glory, um, and uh, it does leave quite a few uh, 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 sort of unfortunate holes that we're hoping to resolve. Um, the starting point is the Court of Justice of the EU's judgment in Ruiz Zambrano, uh, and I've put on this first slide, which I hope you can all see, um, the key uh, extract from that judgment, uh, where the court decided that Article 20 of the uh, treaty, which is uh, the, the article that gives citizenship uh, or creates EU citizenship, uh, must be interpreted as precluding a refusal uh, of a right to reside and a right to uh, a, a work permit in circumstances where a third country national care of, of, of a child who is an EU citizen, um, uh, that EU citizen would then um, be deprived of the genuine enjoyment of the substance of their rights. And that would occur where if, if the right to, to residence was refused, uh, the EU citizen child would be required to leave. Now it's an unusual case because the Court of Justice was considering the situation uh, in relation to um, a third country national with a, a, who is the carer of a national who is a citizen of that member state. So there's no cross-border element, but what it says is uh, if you have a British citizen child who is cared for by a third country national and refusing a right of residence to that parent or carer uh, would force the parent to leave the UK and take the child with them, effectively therefore you've deprived the child of the substance of the citizenship right, which is granted by Article 20 of the Freedom uh, of the Treaty, uh, and therefore you can't do that as a member state. Um, two important points to note about that formulation. Uh, it's a prohibition uh, on uh, refusing a, a right of residence or a right of a, per, uh, of a um, work permit, uh, and it only applies um, exceptionally, said the court, in circumstances where um, the child would be deprived of the genuine enjoyment of the substance of the right and therefore be required to leave the UK. Can we go to the next slide, please, or the EU? Um, the government uh, implemented the decision uh, in Ruiz Zambrano um, through the 2012 EEA regulations, which inserted Regulation 15A uh, into the uh, 26, 2006 EU regulations. Uh, and those have now been incorporated, or have since been incorporated into the 2016 uh, regulations. Um, so what we have, uh, it, it, but effectively these regulations, or this regulation was introduced in 2012. Uh, and what it set down was the criteria uh, for establishing a derivative right to reside in the UK on Ruiz Zambrano's grounds. Uh, and effectively, uh, it's evidence or, or is a clear um, statement of what the Secretary of State at that time thought uh, the Zambrano right to reside entailed um, and how, how it should be defined. So it applies where there's um, a person who is a primary care of a British citizen, 
the relevant British citizen is residing in the UK, and that British citizen child would be unable to reside in the UK if the carer P were required to leave. Uh, and in those circumstances, that person has a derivative right to reside. Uh, and the regulation was pretty clear in that respect. And there's nothing in subparagraph 4A which suggests um, that that right to reside uh, would not pertain in circumstances where P already had limited leave to remain on another ground. In fact, the regulation specifically excluded um, those persons who had indefinite leave to remain. So the legislator did put their mind to the question of what happens where somebody has indefinite leave to remain. Uh, well, they don't need a Ruiz Zambrano right to reside, so we're going to exclude them from the scope of the regulation. Uh, but implicitly left within that anybody who has a limited, uh, uh, who has limited leave. If we then just turn to the next slide, please. Uh, and that was confirmed expressly in the Secretary of State's guidance at the time, uh, where it was said uh, that where somebody has limited leave to remain and can demonstrate they meet all the requirements, then it's possible for them to derive a derivative right of residence. Um, so, so far, so good. Uh, and there's no problem for anybody who has uh, limited leave to remain and wants to apply for a residence permit on Zambrano grounds. Can we turn to the next slide, please? Uh, then, however, um, the Secretary of State changed her mind, and, and part of the one of the reasons for that um, was the uh, Court of Appeals judgment in Patel. Now, I won't go into too much detail about the facts of Patel, but simply to say um, that Patel wasn't concerned with the circumstances we are concerned with in this case, that is somebody who has, already has limited leave to remain on other grounds. Uh, it, it was concerned with whether um, a, a joint couple uh, may have, or the circumstances in which a couple or somebody caring for an elderly relative uh, may be able to establish a right to reside on um, Zambrano grounds. Um, but there were a couple of obiter dicta which the Secretary of State leapt on. Um, the first is a paragraph 68, which in fact wasn't even a dictum of the court, um, but was a, a restatement of the submission made to the court. Uh, and that was the uh, a, a comment that um, uh, if somebody, if Mr. Patel in that case uh, had succeeded in their Article 8 claim on the facts of that case, uh, then there wouldn't have been a need for the, him to uh, have a leave to remain on Ruiz, under the Ruiz Zambrano principle. Um, in, in other words, it would obviate the need for leave. Um, but even interpreted uh, and even taken as a statement of the court, which it was not, um, that doesn't say that uh, a Zambrano right is extinguished uh, on the grant of uh, limited leave on Article 8 grounds. Uh, and the other passage was in paragraph 6076, um, where the court, talking about the exceptional nature of the Zambrano principle, said it can't be regarded as a backdoor route to residence um, for third country national parents uh, who have married British citizens and had children without having leave to remain the normal route for those people is to apply uh, under Article 8. And, and so the court was indicating there um, that just because uh, there is a potential breach of Article 8 shouldn't then entitle to you to a right to reside on Zambrano grounds. But what the court was not saying was that if you do have a right to reside on Zambrano grounds, uh, then that means you, your right to reside, sorry, if you do have a right to reside on Article 8 grounds, uh, then that means your right to reside on, on under Zambrano principle uh, is extinguished. Um, can we turn to the next slide, please? Uh, nonetheless, the Secretary of State changed her guidance on the back of those obiter dicta uh, and said in 2019 um, that a derivative right to reside under Zambrano grounds is only available if a person um, uh, it, it has no other means to remain lawfully in the UK. And as a result of that, if you've got limited leave or if you can get limited leave on Article 8 grounds, you should apply under Appendix FM uh, and re regulate your residence in that way. Uh, and further, the, if you then apply um, for leave on Zambrano or for a right of residence permit on, on Zambrano grounds, this must, must be refused um, if uh, you've never applied under Appendix FM or you've been refused under Appendix FM, but your circumstances have changed and you could be eligible um, now. 
Um, so that excluded a, a vast number of people. If you think that the crossover between people who might have um, uh, a potential uh, leave to remain or uh, right under Appendix FM to limited leave to remain on Article 8 grounds uh, and people who are covered by the Zambrano principle is quite extensive. Uh, that had quite a significant effect on the number of people who could be eligible for a Zambrano residence permit. Uh, but as I've said, there was absolutely no basis for that, either in the regulation as we've seen, uh, or in the decision in Riz Zambrano or any of the um, subsequent case law, or in the domestic case law in Patel. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this was then carried into the EU settlement scheme um, because the Secretary of State made a policy choice, wasn't required uh, under the withdrawal agreement, um, to include persons with a Zambrano right to reside within the scope of the EU settlement scheme. Uh, and in doing so, she then, or he at the time, I believe, defined um, a person with a Zambrano right to reside restrictively to exclude, and we can see that in subparagraph B of the definition there on the slide, anybody who has uh, leave to remain or enter in the UK um, unless it's uh, granted under Appendix EU. Um, so that's carried over into the scheme, the position that was in the guidance, which is if you have limited leave to remain on any grounds, you can't get a Zambrano um, right to reside or you don't have a Zambrano right to reside. Uh, and that's particularly significant, as Beos has explained, because um, the EU settlement scheme is much more, generally, much more beneficial to um, uh, people um, and, and entitles you after five years to uh, indefinite leave to remain, um, with all of the entitlements that come with indefinite leave to remain and settled status. Um, whereas um, persons who are granted leave under Appendix FM generally go through the 10-year uh, route to settlement, they're not entitled to um, public funds uh, unless they're destitute and can have an amendment to their um, leave, um, and um, they have to reapply regularly for a hefty fee um, uh, over the course of the 10 years, and if there is any gap in that period, um, then uh, they're instantly put back to the beginning of the 10-year period. Uh, and that was why the claimant in this case, um, when she turned to apply under Appendix EU and was refused, sought to challenge this provision, um, as well as the Secretary of State's guidance, which I've just shown you. Can we turn to the next slide, please? Um, so as I've said, the judge uh, found that there was absolutely no basis for the Secretary of State's position on the law or the change, her change in guidance. There's nothing in the um, CJU decision in Zambrano or in any of the subsequent jurisprudence, domestic or otherwise, um, that supports the theory that the existence of a limited leave to remain of itself automatically extinguishes a claim for Zambrano residents. And on the contrary, when you look at the facts of Zambrano itself, um, there, there was a tacit acknowledgement from the Court of Justice that uh, it's possible to have limited leave to remain on, on, from, on national grounds, as well as a wider Zambrano right to remain, uh, and the two can coexist. Uh, if we turn to the next slide, please. Um, and then um, further than that, when one looks at the 2016 regulations, those regulations are perfectly clear, uh, and there's nothing on any um, natural, fair, reasonable, or plain reading of those words that suggests or, or even implies um, that a derivative uh, right to reside um, uh, is extinguished where there's a, a limited leave to remain. Um, and so, uh, interpreting the regulations, there was just absolutely no basis for the Secretary of State's position. Can we turn to the next slide, please? Um, and um, indeed, uh, uh, Mr. Justice Mostyn thought it troubling um, that the uh, Secretary of State had issued guidance effectively to ignore the clear terms of um, his own regulations uh, and therefore to act unlawfully in, in 2019. Um, the question of remedy, which is on the next slide, um, the, the consequence, really, of, of the decision that the, the Secretary of State had got the law wrong is that she, uh, firstly, her guidance 
had to be um, declared unlawful. And we can see that in three. Um, uh, uh, what the phrase used there is legally erroneous uh, insofar that they state to a right to reside is not available. Uh, but also when she framed uh, Annex 1 of Appendix EU, that's the definition of a person with a Zambrano right to reside, she misdirected herself on the law. Um, and so uh, she erred in law with them, therefore the, Ms. Mostyn granted a declaration in relation to that uh, Appendix EU also. Um, now, that's not to say, of course, that the Secretary of State can't go away and as a policy, policy choice, make another decision on how she wishes to define a person with a Zambrano right to reside, having properly directed herself on the legal position. Um, and um, whether or not she does that remains to be seen. And perhaps Simon could talk a bit more about that when we talk about remedy. Um, naturally, of course, uh, Ms. Uh, um, uh, Asikanya was entitled herself to a quashing order of the decision refusing her leave to remain. Uh, and, and that means uh, under Appendix EU, uh, and that means that she will be entitled to a new decision, although that decision is on hold. Um, and then the judge uh, in the fourth paragraph there, uh, sorry? Yes, um, the judge uh, made an order that there would be a further hearing um, to determine the question of whether he should quash particular provisions either in Annex 1, uh, uh, sorry, in, in Appendix EU, um, and uh, what the form of order that should be. Uh, and we're having that hearing tomorrow. Now, the, the reason that hearing has become particularly complex and difficult, if we can turn to the next slide, is of course because of the looming deadline uh, of the 30th of June. Uh, and the simple position is um, that any application for leave under Appendix EU must be made by the 30th of June. And a failure to make an application by that deadline leads to all sorts of consequences for those who, who don't apply. Um, there is, uh, a, 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 under Appendix EU, it's possible for the Secretary of State to um, consider late applications. And she has said that she will do so liberally. There's also uh, this provision, which I've put on uh, this slide, which is important, um, which says effectively that if you're somebody who already has limited leave to remain, um, uh, uh, then the deadline is effectively extended until the expiry of that leave. Um, so that's obviously very helpful for those Zambrano carers who have limited to to remain. They're waiting for the outcome of the judgment to decide whether to make an application under Appendix EU. Uh, and uh, um, the deadline for them is effectively extended until the expiry of their leave. Um, however, there's another problem which that does not resolve. And that's my next slide. Um, the problem is uh, the um, uh, grace period regulations. Uh, now, what effectively, uh, effectively what happens under those regulations is they extend uh, the uh, effect of EU law and the EEA regulations um, for a particular period and for particular persons. In the normal course, the Zambrano right to reside under the EEA regulations expires on the 30th of June. Um, and that deadline is extended if you make an application before the 30th of June, and that's the provision here. Uh, so anybody who applies under Appendix EU, uh, they, their, their right to reside will continue, um, provided they made their application before the 30th of June, that's the application deadline. But anyone who applies after the application of the deadline, they're not protected by these grace period regulations. So automatically, as a matter of law, they no longer have any right of residence in the UK. They may still be granted leave under Appendix EU when the Secretary of State finally gets around to making a decision on their application uh, as a late application, but in that intervening period, they don't have a right to reside. And that has all sorts of consequences, um, which uh, we will look into into a bit more detail. Um, and then if we can just go to is there a third slide. Um, Yes, this is a question um, which, of course, many of you will have, which is whether it's possible to make an application uh, under Appendix EU while you have a pending application under Appendix FM. Of course, lots of people will have been told, according to the guidance, that they should make their application under Appendix FM first. And this says, helpfully, uh, that um, if you then go on to make an application under Appendix EU, your first application under Appendix FM will not be treated as withdrawn. 
Simon is going to talk in more detail about that provision uh, and some of the more tricky and knotty problems um, that we're going to be hoping to resolve at tomorrow's hearing. Thanks very much, Mike. Um, actually, no, go, go, go back, Ray, that's fine. Um, so, um, as Mike's explained, um, the uh, change of heart that the Home Office had about the meaning of the Zambrano right to reside, which coincided with their policy decision to apply uh, the settlement scheme to the Zambrano cases, um, has been reversed by the judge. Now, that decision may not be final. The Home Office are seeking to appeal it to the Court of Appeal. Um, but for the time being, what that means, as Mike has explained, is that while there were EEA rights, and those EEA rights currently expire for, for generally speaking, on the 30th of June, while, where there were EEA rights, uh, um, people enjoyed the right to reside uh, as Zambrano carers, even if they had uh, also had leave to remain. Um, it, it, on a limited basis under other provisions of the immigration rules. That means they also enjoyed that right if they were someone who could get leave to remain under Appendix FM. So practitioners will know that since the scheme was introduced, the Home Office has been refusing uh, to grant uh, PSS, pre-settled status, or settled status to Zambrano carers if they either have limited leave to remain or could get limited leave to remain. Uh, and the effect of the judge's ruling is that the law now uh, is that that was based on a misunderstanding, a misdirection of EU law and Regulation 16 of the uh, EEA regulations. So I just want to look at what is going to happen next and try to elaborate on some of the points that Mike's raised um, in three areas. First of all, in Ms. Akintanya's case, secondly, to the rules, and lastly, to other people who may be affected. Uh, now, in Ms. Akinsanya's case, um, the Home Office have until Monday to file an application with the Court of Appeal for permission to appeal. They were refused by the, the judge. Um, and what, one assumes they'll do so, and they uh, will, with that application, they also have to make an application for expedition. So it, it's possible, in theory, that the Court of Appeal could hear this before the end of July. And it may be that the Home Office will be pressing them to do that. We don't know. We'll have to see um, what they do on Monday. Um, the second thing that will happen uh, um, in, in the case is that there's going to be a hearing tomorrow about what happens in the meantime. Uh, and that's because the Home Office uh, are, are unlikely to make any changes to the rules until the Court of Appeal has decided either their application for permission to appeal by refusing it or has decided to let the appeal go ahead and has heard the appeal. So that means that on the 30th of June, the rules won't have been changed. Uh, and it seems unlikely that the rules are going to be changed. Now, um, that doesn't mean that the rules uh, apply as they did before the judgment. And can you go back to slide 11, uh, Ray? Thank you. Oh, actually, the next one then. Perfect, the one-headed relief, thank you. So if you look at this, what the judge ordered, the judge made a declaration that the Secretary of State erred in law when framing in Annex 1 to Appendix EU the definition of a person with a Zambrano right to reside. Um, and what, what that means is that in terms of other tribunals or courts that might have to decide individual cases and might go ahead with them, that they'll have to, they're bound by, by the judge's declaration. So that's something that I'll mention when we look at what happened in your, your, your other clients' cases. Um, and before I go on to what the hearing is about tomorrow, I just want to run through a series of different kinds of categories that you may have for your clients uh, and say what it seems should be happening or could be happening with them in light of uh, the judgment. So the first category of cases is people who've already got a pending application with the Home Office under Appendix EU on Zambrano grounds. Now, the Home Office has told us that they're going to be putting those applications on the shelf until the, the current proceedings are over. So those people, uh, at the moment, they have a pending application. That's going to go on being pending after 30th of June. The second group of people are those who've already been refused, and they'll have a pending appeal to the first tier tribunal, the upper tribunal. Now, in those cases, uh, it may be that lawyers are going to use 
uh, Roman II there of the, the relief to make arguments in the um, appeal that the tribunal should proceed on the basis that uh, paragraph B should be ignored, for example, for the purposes of determining uh, the appeal, for the purposes of applying the immigration rules on the basis that the tribunal can't uh, refuse an, uh, uh, an appeal by applying an unlawful immigration rule or an immigration rule that's been adopted unlawfully. Um, but I think those issues are quite complicated because the rules haven't been amended. And as Mike said, what the judge didn't do was rule out the possibility that the Home Office might be able to make the rule in the same or in a similar form that they have already. Uh, so the, the, uh, Ms. Akinsanya's claim was put really, if you like, on two bases. The first is that they've misunderstood EU law. And the second was that the rule was irrational or discriminatory. Now, the judge didn't get to that second issue because Ms. Akinsanya won on the first issue. But if the Home Office come back and make the same rule or a different rule, and Ms. Akinsanya still loses under it, then she may go back to court and say, well, actually, I want to you now to consider the second set of arguments I have. I accept that you've based your new rule on a correct understanding of EU law, but I think you're not acting lawfully in treating me differently from a Zambrano carer who doesn't have leave to remain. That's all in the future. Um, but I think that's relevant to arguments that you might be making in appeals. Third group of people is people who might have a possible late appeal uh, from an EU SS refusal. It may be a good idea for them to try and put in a late uh, appeal. Um, and then there's everybody else. That's the people who don't have anything that's pending uh, under Appendix EU. And in, in their situation, then it may be that they'll think that they should now make an application and try to make it before the 30th of June. And if, uh, Ray, can we just clip back through the slides go, going forwards? I'll say stop. Stop. Back one. Can you apply? So this is the slide that mine took you to. This is from the EUSS guidance. Uh, um, and it, it seems to be reasonably clear as guidance that making an application under EUS, Appendix EUSS shouldn't prejudice a pending application that your client or you as an individual already has uh, under, under Appendix FM, because an Appendix FM claim is a human rights claim. Uh, it's in reliance on human rights. Uh, and an uh, uh, EUSS claim um, is the one that's covered by the guidance. Um, we will try to get more clarity out of the Home Office on that issue um, to, to, make it, to uh, uh, give a more complete reassurance to people that they won't be prejudiced by having those two claims at the same time. Um, we haven't got a slide on it, but uh, the, I think that the technical point is that um, under the uh, under Appendix EU, uh, um, paragraph EU 10, subparagraph 2, disapplies certain provisions of uh, paragraph 34BB uh, of the immigration rules. Um, and it's 34BB that deals with the situation of two simultaneous applications and that provides for uh, the first application to amend, to be treated as an amendment of the second. Um, it's not clear what the Home Office policy here is. I suspect that the Home Office wanted to treat the Appendix EU as a, as a self-contained code, in particular so they could reassure the European Commission that there wouldn't be that kind of impact. Um, but we, will, as I say, we'll be trying to get policy clarity out of them. Um, if for people who want to make those applications, um, the latest guidance is that you can telephone the uh, resolution centre, tell them you want to be emailed the paper form, uh, and they will then email it to you, and then you can email it back to them. But you can't email to them a paper form that you didn't get by email, because yeah, home office. Um, so just to go into a bit more detail about Mike's point about uh, the significance of the 30th of June. Can we go back one? Back another one? Right. So as Mike's shown you, under the rules, Appendix EU, 
the deadline for making your application, if you already have Appendix FM leave, is when that leave expires. So someone with Appendix FM leave that's going to run out in September just needs to make their EUSS application before in order for it to be, in order for it to uh, count as made by the required date under the rules. Um, we're not entirely clear whether that uh, where, where that, that rule says uh, um, that a person has limited leave to enter, that that includes someone who's got limited leave to enter as extended by, a, by Section 3C of the Immigration Act, that is, someone who's made an application before their leave expires um, and the application hasn't been determined before the date their leave would have expired. But we will be also asking for the Home Office for clarity on that. But on a straightforward reading of it, it seems to include appendix, uh, it seems to include section 3C leave. In other words, if you make an appendix FM application before your current leave expires, your appendix EU deadline under the rule runs down to, or runs as long as you still have a pending application or a pending appeal about your appendix FM application. But if we could go on one, Ray, please. Thank you. The problem is that the uh, grace period regulations, the application deadline regulations that are quoted here, don't have the same text. So for them, application deadline just means the 30th of June. There's nothing in them that says that it's extended if you already have leave to remain. So that means for everybody who either has leave to remain or doesn't have leave to remain, the uh, um, grace period ends on the 30th of June, unless they've made an application under Appendix EU by that date. Now, the, what that means for uh, our clients is that on the 30th of June, they cease to have a Zambrano right to reside because it's these regulations, not Appendix EU, that extends their right to reside under EU law. And the problem there is that the immigration is that Appendix EU requires that for uh, the, the person who makes a Zambrano application has a Zambrano right to reside at the date they make the application. So that seems, and it may be that the Home Office will have come up with a more liberal interpretation of these rules uh, for tomorrow's hearing, but that it seems that your Zambrano right ends on the 30th of June unless you've made an EUSS application. And unless they amend the rules, you then can't qualify under the rules for making your uh, Zambrano application after the 30th of June. So the argument the judge will hear tomorrow is that that would undermine the effectiveness of the judge's judgment. Because it would mean that in practice, it's only the group of people who have the uh, uh, um, red hot lawyers and advisors who know about this case, who are listening to this seminar, who are hearing what I'm saying now, who are now going to be ringing up the resolution center, getting an email form and getting it back all in two weeks. And out there, there will be hundreds or maybe thousands of people who will gradually hear about this through social media, but don't know now, and therefore they won't be able to benefit. So that's why tomorrow, Ms. Akinsonia is asking the court to um, extend the uh, deadline under the regulations in order to extend the right to reside of um, the people who are supposed to benefit from the judgment. Um, I think there was one question I saw in the chat, which was the benefits. I don't think the judgment changes uh, the position about benefits because at least for the core means tested benefits, the Zambrano right to reside doesn't count. Um, I think we can have a discussion another time about whether people who've got PSS on a Zambrano basis are, are entitled to benefits in light of the uh, approach of the Court of Appeal in Fratilla, um, but that's for another seminar. So I'll hand back to you, maybe Bea, for any questions. I see lots of questions. Hi, uh, yeah, sure. Let's have a look. Um, so I think a few of them have been answered, to be honest, but I'll, I'll go through them anyway. Um, 
Let's see. Why don't you tell us the ones you think we should answer? Yeah. We'll try it, or you answer them even better. Um, well, the first question is how to get hold of a paper application form. And I've actually just posted a link in the chat um, that one of our attendees kindly shared um, to the government UK website so that um, application forms are now available online to be submitted by email. Um, that link's in the chat. Um, let's see, what's the scenario? Um, So from a practical viewpoint, can we have suggestions as to which application should be submitted now? For example, someone on the 10 year route under Appendix FM has an application pending who would only be granted pre-settled status as a Zambrano carer, but has or is likely to be granted recourse to public funds at present. Is there a risk of losing eligibility if granted? Um, yeah, so I know we didn't really want to cover Fratilla, but that seems to be quite a wide concern, whether it's worth people making the application for pre-settled status and risk not being able to access public funds. Uh, sorry, we just, just just want to see the whole text. Um, That's from Rob. So, I, I mean, you're not going to get leave under the Zambrano route um, until the Court of Appeal has decided this. So uh, uh, what that, and even then you might not. So, so I think what you've got is you've got, um, you, you've got a risk that for a certain period of time, your client might just have PSS and might subject to the argument that I said we wouldn't go into, but um, <laughs> on the view of the government won't be entitled to, to benefits. Now, uh, um, the, um, what you we the stuff here that has yet to play out right but 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 one point here is that sorry the first point is we don't know what the amended rules will look like so it's really hard to we can't predict that with any confidence and if we can't readily advise clients about what the rules will look like in three months time but what we do know is that if the court's judgment is is not reversed by the court of appeal then the zambrano right isn't affected by the fact that you've got any leave to remain you have them both you have the Zambrano right, and you have the leave to remain. If the, the, the Appendix EU stays in the current form, then, then the right to settled status under Appendix EU comes from having the Zambrano right. You don't need to have had PSS. You need to be able to make a timely application. Well, they, I mean, that might be an, an issue for tomorrow because what the guidance says is that they, you, they will consider both applications, but it doesn't say which application they will consider first or which will take priority. Sure. Uh, especially in the meantime, while this judgment is ongoing, will they decide the Appendix FM application and just put the Appendix EU on hold? But, but also, I suppose my, my point is that if, if the uh, rules end up being true to the judgment, then it won't matter whether you um, made an application, you're, you're a Zambrano carer, even if you stayed on uh, uh, Appendix EU. Mm. Sorry, even if you stayed on Appendix FM. Yeah. So you can stay on Appendix FM, you can get your benefits, and then once you've done your five years, you can say, I was having some brown, no care for that whole time. But what if it's your first Appendix FM application and you want a decision on that? Exactly. You're right. Then, then we disrupt don't it by making an Appendix EU application, but you've got to make it both. Because they, might, because they might say both of them. Yeah. I mean, in that situation, I suppose the worst case scenario is you withdraw your Appendix EU application. Yeah. yeah but then you've got the deadline problem. Yeah, but what you've done is you, you've protected your position for the time being. I mean, I, I think where clients need to have leave to remain without a public funds condition, uh, um, they obviously need to make an Appendix FM application. They want that decided really quickly. Um, and I, I think the risk you run is of making a US application is that that will somehow delay it or mess it up. And then I think it really depends on your readiness and availability to go to the courts to say, actually, you shouldn't be waiting. You can just grant my Appendix FM application um, and you'll just put my Appendix EU application on ice. You shouldn't keep me out of the benefits and the rules that you say I'm entitled to because I'm also asking for something else. Um, but I think that depends on your client's willingness to litigate and, your, and, and their access to legal services in order to go to court about that. And I accept that some people won't want to do that, um, but 
but there are obviously high stakes. It's a very yeah. tricky dilemma, isn't it? It is, and we don't know. Uh, uh, we can't properly advise on the risks because we're we're really making a political judgment as well about what's going to be done for our individual clients. Sorry. Okay. Uh, what's the situation for parents of children who are currently awaiting a decision on an application to register their child as a British citizen? Uh, it doesn't change for them. They haven't. They're not Zambrano carers. They haven't got a British citizen child. So, uh, uh, and if the, their only child, if they don't have any British citizen, if they don't have someone who's a British citizen child on the thirty first of December, then they can't qualify un under the current version of the rules. Um, because they weren't didn't have a Zambrano right to reside at the end of the um, uh, at, at, at the start of the grace period when the UK left the EU law scheme on the thirty first of December. So I think it's really unlikely. I'd have thought, unless we have a different Home Secretary, uh, that the um, rules will be more generous to those people. I think we're really only talking about people who had a British citizen child. On the before the 31st of December. There's a few of these questions. Can a parent who is sharing responsibility of a British child with another parent make an application under Zambrano for EUSS? So there's a parallel issue that's been going on, been argued in the courts, uh, which is about giving a literal interpretation of the of Regulation 16. So on a straightforward reading, Regulation 16 since 2018 has not excluded from its Zambrano provisions someone who has a British citizen fellow primary carer or a settled primary carer. That was changed in 2018. Now, this judgment doesn't decide that, uh, but what the second half of the judgment does is says that even if the judge had been wrong about the scope of the Zambrano right, he still would have just read the words of the regulation as they are, because what the Home Office were asking him to do was to read extra words in that he couldn't do as an interpretation of UK law. So I think you can use that half of the judgment, which isn't an issue directly now, you can use that half of the judgment to argue for a literal interpretation of Regulation 16.5 um, to apply to people whose fellow primary carer is a British citizen or a settled person, at least since the rule regulation was amended in 2018. Yeah. Um, there's also a few people asking, I'm paraphrasing, um, is there scope to apply for EUSS under Zambrano grounds if you've never previously had the derivative right? I applied for that derivative right, but you've only ever been granted under Appendix FM as the parent of a British child. You don't need that. You don't need to have had a grant of a permit to be eligible. It's only if you have a right to re right to reside under Regulation 16 and had one on 31st of December. So there's no need to have made a Zambrano application before you make an application under Appendix EU. Other well, questions are building up. Uh, if the UK citizen child was born after 31st of December, is that too late for an Appendix EU application to be made? Yeah, as it's currently written. Yeah, it's very unlikely to change. 31st of December 2020. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what will the time already accrued as a Zambrano carer count towards settled status given that it is an acquired right as per SANA? Um, it depends on what the rule says. And it will depend in individual cases before the rule is amended if you can persuade a first tier tribunal judge to go ahead and hear the appeal on the basis of the acting tenure judgment. We don't know the answer to that question. Mm. Um, I saw one that was interesting earlier. What about people that were refused? who applied with no right of appeal were refused before um, December 31st. I mean, they should just put up another application in, surely. So, so yes, just to recap, if, if you applied before the 31st of January, 2020, then you won't get a right of appeal. 
Uh, but the Home Office is very clear. That doesn't stop you making a second application, whether you've already been refused or you've got one pending. Uh, and so certainly my advice would be to make an application before the 30th of uh, June. I mean, I think except this point about benefits or this point about the impact on your FLR uh, Appendix FM application, I don't see any good reason why, you, why people shouldn't make another application before the 30th of June. And that's the most obvious way to protect your rights. What that means is that under the regulations, your right to reside continues until that's decided. It means you get a right of appeal. And it means that it'll sit there with the Home Office until the Court of Appeal decides the case. Will the fate of a person with a derivative card, as a Zambronica, be subjected to the appeal outcome for pending EUSS applications? Sorry, I don't understand that. Having a derivative card isn't going to protect you. Um, so the derivative car will cease to apply on the 30th of June unless you've made an appendix EU application or the judge in, in the Atkinsania proceedings extends the deadline. Um, that Because the EU law stops applying on the 30th of June, except for people who've applied under appendix EU. Sure. And Praxis are asking, what about clients who could have applied previously to the EU settlement scheme as a Sembrano carer, but did not because of the guidance and whose child has since turned 18? Is there an argument that they were unlawfully prevented from exercising their rights, even if they did not apply? Curveball practice, Praxis, curveball, that's a good one. <laughs> You're supposed to email that stuff in advance. I mean, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. What's the, yes, no? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so to that, it sounds bad, doesn't it? It's, it does sound awkward. Yeah. Uh, but that would have to be someone who, where the child turns 18 or, or, or ceased to be a child uh, um, after the 31st of December 2020, um, I think. Because the guidance specifically said don't apply under Appendix EU if you've, you should apply under Appendix FM first. He did. And that was wrong. Uh, yes, it was. O on the judgment, I think. I know there's a sort of legitimate expectation. Yeah, <laughs> not no, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know. It's just drafting grounds on the hoof. Yeah. And I, I think, um, generally speaking, you won't do any harm if you make an application under Appendix EU, even if your child is aged out. Um, so most obviously, if your child aged out, so stopped being 18, as, sorry, had their 18th birthday after the 31st of January, but before now, uh, then uh, um, in those cases, I, I would make an application um, because at least then you've got your foot in the door for whatever comes out of the case. We don't know what the rules will look like. Project 17, just I think the last question, uh, because we're running out of time. What about people who have a pending EUSS application but whose Appendix FM leave will need renewal? Will that withdraw the EUSS application? So, so if you have a pending Appendix EU application, uh, then Section 3C applies to that application. So you remain lawfully here even if your other leave expires. Yeah. So you don't become unlawfully here and you'll get a right of appeal and your leave will then continue while you have that appeal if you're refused, which you won't get a refusal now because they put them on hold. I think your problem, your, the risk is uh, that you, you, under the rules, the new rules that come through, you won't qualify, your, your appendix EU will, will uh, fail, uh, and then the Home Office will say to you, oh, you've broken your 10-year residence. Uh, so for that period in the middle, you didn't have uh, Appendix FM leave. You've got to start again. I think that's the, that's the risk. I think the question is whether whether an Appendix EU application will will act as an implicit withdrawal of the. Appendix yeah. So that's FM. why you have to. That's yeah. why it's important to. Make, sorry, I was just going to say that's why it's important to make an Appendix FM application. Yeah. Um, and, and I think and the, the guidance works both ways. In in that if if you're yeah, the second if the second application is an appendix EU application, that doesn't withdraw the, the appendix FM according to the guidance. Well, well it, that would seem to be the logic of the guidance. 
um, and, and I think that uh, what should happen is that the Home Office should write back in the worst case scenario and say, um, you can only have one application, which one do you want? And at that point, you should say to them, well, the guidance says I can have two. Um, and, and But again, there may be, there is a risk, there's always a risk to the Home Office that they'll act unlawfully and that your client will need to perhaps claim judicial review of the decision to treat one of the applications as withdrawn. And your client may not want to take that risk and they rather just stay on the Appendix FM track. But that means they are risking not being able to get settled status under Appendix EU. It's very difficult. I mean, it's horrible that the clients are in this position. We, um, you know, Bayer, with the support of the sector, was able to persuade the judge uh, that with the, this hearing should be expedited. So we got a really fast hearing. Um, we will try to get what we can tomorrow, but I'm afraid there isn't any um, clear cut, confident answers that we can give to all of these people in these situations, which is horrible for everybody. Sorry. On that okay. chair. On that note, oh, well, uh, so I've just had just very quickly, I can see a few questions saying, does the five year period run from the date the child became British? Yes, it does. Um, it's or gone the six. You became the primary carer if that was later. Yeah. yeah. yeah whichever one um it's gone six so thank you so much for joining us i hope that the recording will be helpful for everybody and if you can go back through the recording go back through the slides um might answer some questions that you're you're still confused about and hopefully we'll have further updates after tomorrow's hearing um and we'll know soon whether secretary of state has been granted permission to appeal to the Court of Appeal also. Uh, before we go, um, yep. can you tell people what would be the best way for them to see any updates from Hackney Law Centre about any order or the court makes or any promises or commitments the Home Office makes? So we'll, from now, put updates on our website, via Twitter and also on our Facebook, all of which are very easily accessible by Google. Um, Okay, Simon, Mike, anything final you'd like to add? No, thank you, Bear, for organising such an efficient webinar. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Um, and I'm sorry that we couldn't ask all the, answer all the questions. I hope we've helped clear up some things. Um, there may well be another one of these once we know more. But thanks, Bear. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, Chris.